All right, guys, welcome to a very, very special, very exciting episode of the Watercraft Journal Live Session IRL. I am your host. My name is Kevin Shaw. I'm the editor in chief of the Watercraft Journal. And we have some very exciting stuff to talk about today, especially for you performance enthusiasts, guys who've been looking out on the new engines coming out of SeaDoo and Yamaha. This is going to be a lot of really cool information, stuff that I think is going to knock your socks off just like it has me. But we're going to let the crowd kind of build up for just a minute. So I'm going to talk about a couple bits of news. Then we're going to bring on our guests. Number one, upcoming videos. Sea Dude Tricks 2024 is happening this week. We will have that for you here on the magazine. I'm hoping for Wednesday, if not Thursday. Next week is finally going to be the Turbocharged Balassi review. So we're going to have that for you as well. Uh, we have some really cool articles coming out this week on Watercraft Journal. So go to www.watercraftjournal.com where new articles are written and published every single day, Monday through Friday, entirely subscription free to you. That is really the big thing for that right now. I really didn't want to waste any more time because I know a lot of you guys are waiting. Um, yes, David, very good question about our mud bug review. Uh, we do not have a mud bug event coverage coming, but we do have the shootout between the 2023 Kawasaki Ultra LXS 160 and the GTX uh, 170 from Cedu. <laughs> And we did that. We did a comparison video with Greg Gaddis, and that will be a couple weeks later. That's going to be about two weeks, maybe maybe three weeks, depending on our schedule. But that is going to be uh, another video in the hopper. Thank you very much. I almost passed over that one, David. I appreciate that. All right, guys. So let me uh, start today by bringing up our, well, first, I want to bring our guests on. I jumped ahead of the. I jumped ahead of the. <laughs> but as you guys can see, we we have got two guests today. Obviously, you guys will recognize Greg Gaddis of Greenholt Garage and Greenholt.net. Greg is here to help us out, and we are very excited to welcome the CEO of Fuel Tech, Mr. Anderson Dick, who, to my understanding, you were in Malta this weekend. Previous. The previous, previous weekend. weekend, yes. The previous weekend, tuning drag, uh, uh, tuning blown dragsters. Yeah, so, actually, the world's fastest four-cylinder dragsters. The world's fastest four-cylinder dra dragster, and we're gonna sit here and pick your brain about jet skis. So, yeah. <laughs> I'd much rather talk about the dragsters. But hey, listen, Anderson, thank you very much for coming on today. I know you're a very busy man, and yeah. Fuel Tech is a world leader in performance tuning and i was uh, i was actually really excited when greg made the introduction i was like you've been talking with him and he goes oh yeah and i'm like dude all the guys i know from sema like talk to anderson and he's like yeah 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 yeah, yeah he's he's doing jet skis i'm like okay so i'm glad we were able to have this conversation um i want to start with the big news that we shared today and that was on the watercraft journal let's bring it up was announcing that Fuel Tech successfully, quote unquote, unlocked the 2024 SeaDo RXPX and RXTX 325. And you were able to do this within five or six days before Hydro Drags. And you, uh, the workaround that you were able to find to get around the Bosch ECU was using the Fuel Tech standalone ECU and creating a harness just in a couple days and then making everything work all the features work all the dash fun functions work and then you went racing with it yeah okay thanks first for the main invite uh, uh you guys uh, know we're new into the jet ski world uh obviously not new into the racing world or into the uh, ecu it's been over 20 years uh, working on this and Definitely, we were very excited to be um, step, stepping on the jet ski world and, and trying to bring something that will collaborate and help. Uh, so thanks, Kevin, as well, and, and Greg. You, you guys have been doing a fantastic job for this community, and uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, here uh, talking to you guys tonight. 
Well, thank you. I, I, again, I know you're a busy guy, and, and Monday nights are a little unusual. So thank you again for coming on. Yeah. I think the big thing is that Greg and I have been, uh, we've done a couple podcasts together and talking about the new CDUs, and that the biggest hurdle, even though so much really good, really, really awesome technology has been put into the 325 CDU engine, was that they started implementing the use of the Bosch ECU, which two years ago was introduced on the Turbo Maverick side by sides. Mm -hmm. And even to this day, many uh, well, the many tuners are still struggling and trying to find a way to get around that. Uh, some people are cracking open the ECUs and changing processors. Others are trying to use a standalone ECU. But so far, the Bosch ECU remains locked. Is that correct? As I know, I believe so. But uh, again, we were definitely understand that even if it's unlocked if it, even if it becomes unlocked there is really very limited or how far you can go on a, on a stock issue because you can definitely go like a quick tune rpm and a limiter or kind of stuff like that but when you actually compare to a full standalone it's definitely uh, unlimited what you actually can do uh, so uh just to bring back the the, the challenge our great friend uh, fizzle uh calling me last year when he or i mean a few months ago a couple months ago when he bought the 325 and said hey would you guys be interested on on trying to install the fuel tech once it comes around so they say yeah sure the 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 what happened helped us a lot was that we really had spent a lot of the time on the 300 last year and we even we we bought one for r d and we we spent months and months to to the to to recreate the CAN bus to be able to run the IBR and the stock dashboard fully, completely uh, as it would be stock. And that actually was very important. But at the same time, the CAN bus on the new 325, is, 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 it changed a lot. And uh, it really looks like, looks more like uh, the can Maverick than okay. actually the SIDU. Uh, even though that we, so the, the other, uh, let's say, the part that helped us was that we we also spent almost almost six months or two seven months in in the can amps uh, earlier this year so we are actually we are about to release our plug and play and, and, and solution for the can amps so it actually shared a lot of the the same like you say the issue and all that stuff which made a lot easier to do that so to be fair like the the seven days we spent on the 325 was backed up by a year development uh, previously with the 300 and the can -M, we kind of have to to mix those technologies together and do that uh, obviously there was some differences between them uh, including the o2 sensor which is also a great news i mean having the wideband o2 yes. sensor on this key it's a fantastic news uh, yeah, also, and very overdue <laughs> yeah uh, and also the the fact of the the, the pwm uh, pump uh, the fuel pump is also very interesting. It took us, uh, I mean, we, we do that already in different applications. So we, we just had to identify the, the module, the, the, the PWM solid state module they, they are actually using, which is a great product. Finally, SIDU also fixed that problem where the stock ECU had not enough current to drive a, a better fuel pump. And now technically it seems that the the SIDU come already with a better fuel pump already yes we were talking a little bit about that and i think that's something that that does bear a little bit of uh of discussion and repeating for us but mm -hmm. was in uh well uh i guess we should skip ahead to your testing and what were your results mm -hmm. in 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 applying your stand your, your new standalone wire harness and the EC and the standalone ECU. Yeah. So they, once we actually the the the, the 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 very tight schedule we had was literally literally to finish the, the the wiring diagram, build the first prototype harness, then make sure the CAN bus works, and uh, obviously the few the the wide two and the, everything works as possible as as, as we could. 
the goal was not even to tune the jet ski, but it happened that Fizio got so excited, he took the airplane <laughs> and came to, to personally come and test on the lake. So the jet ski had zero hours at that moment, literally. That was the first minute the ski actually touched the water. Uh, and uh, we didn't even, even Fizio was a little uh, kind of, oh, we don't, we don't really have to push this zero hour ski. Let's, let's just make sure everything runs, say, okay, then couple of minutes later I took I took it and I, I did a, a ride and we ended up figuring the the, the base tune-up was very similar to the 300 obviously the engine is not really much different uh, it does have uh, one one additional psi of boost uh, basically and uh, and the, the fuel pressure increased from 58 pounds of fuel pressure to 87 pounds of fuel pressure uh, and that's impressive because uh, so many guys previously, if you're going to do a state, maybe I mean a stage one or even a stage two, you were changing out the fuel pump just to mm -hmm. keep the engine fed on the 300. And you were able to see that uh, even with this base tune, the fuel pump and the, and the injectors were more than more than able to take care of it. In fact, you had a lot left. Yeah, technically the injectors they 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 were being used at seventy six percent duty cycle, and that wasn't a very conservative conservative tune up. Uh, to have an idea, that was eleven point eleven six air fuel. Uh, typically, if you're tuning for performance, you're probably going depending on the tuner, you're probably going a little leaner than that. Okay. Uh, and but even on a rich safe tune up, that means that the injectors are able to handle probably four hundred thirty horsepower. So wow! You, you can get an extra 100 horsepower without touching fuel system, likely. Um, so, I would say that once we actually adjusted the the base fuel pressure tuning side on the ECU, uh, we 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 came down to this dirty cycle on the injectors, and everything really added up very closely. The timing seems to be we try like one degree, two degrees up up and down, but the timing seems to be around there uh obviously we're not even looking to a uh a, a, a speed run or or really really testing performance we had a full tank of gasoline uh we didn't even play with trims uh it was literally like just making sure the system was working the plug and play was working everything was as should be as a as a development side not the, as a performance comparison full tank of fuel Lake Alatuna, Georgia. Yeah. Not messing with the trim. Do you mind me asking how much you weigh? Uh, 170. 170 <laughs> pounds. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Guys, uh, the, the, I mean, again, a very conservative tune. Put mm -hmm. it on, and that thing's going 81. And you're telling me that the, the stock fuel supply, the stock, the stock system could very likely hold up to 450 horse so yeah i believe four, 430 would be oh, the right number yeah okay uh, maximum well, hey listen just a few years ago 430 horsepower was was pretty badass so that's uh that's really impressive for a stock machine that all it takes is using the right you know contr engine control hardware to to really unlock it. Yeah. So, One thing about the, the uh, so a lot of people only looks, look like for the, the final number, but there's a lot more you actually obviously get from performance, which is throttle response, not only not, not only opening the throttle, but how you close the throttle, uh, the, the how you actually uh, come up in acceleration. And that's one of the things uh, even on the hydro drags, uh, was very clear because the jet ski performance performance probably better than most everyone expected, especially in the rough water that was there. Uh, but the 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 usually we got a lot of feedback about how the ski is responding so much better. Uh, okay. And uh, that's one of the tasks or where clearly sometimes the stock is you 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 are limited because you really don't have too much of resources to to do that kind of stuff. Okay. Okay. So what uh, I think the big thing a, a lot of people are concerned about is with the new CDUs, um, what, well, I, 
okay, for example, uh, the package that we presented in in, mm -hmm. in today's article was the FT five fifty. Yep. The harness, mm -hmm. and then um, the ignition the ignition box, the module. Yes. The, and uh, the, the wideband reader or yeah the, the nano the pro and the spark pro 3. Mm -hmm. okay now that that's a that's a considerable package mm -hmm. and i think that scared a lot of people who had become i don't want to say spoiled but because it was because tuning had been so easy with mm -hmm. the th with the previous ecu and with the 300s that to say, hey, there's a you know a thirty six hundred dollar price tag. Oh, whoa, 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 you know what happened mm -hmm. here? And my understanding, and you can correct me, I'm I'm happy to be wrong in this case, but this isn't so much a reflash as it is more equipping this machine to go so much further beyond what the factory ECU would allowed you to do. Yeah. And um, this is pretty much same as we do in every application. We actually offer something because I'll, I'll give an example. This package, let's say you ride on your, your ski for a couple of years. Then you decide to buy a new 350 SIDU, whatever comes next. Uh, right. <laughs> you, you actually unplug that. You, you, you plug in your new ECU, your, your new jet ski or the issue itself is absolutely the same as uh, or your Honda or your LS engine or your car. So, uh, for example, we have pretty much the used market for fuel tech issues is absolutely uh, uh, amazing because you, you literally have almost almost your, the price you paid for for the product in a few years. So a lot of people you have to consider is different when you're spending the money, for example, to purchase a reflash. The reflash, you cannot get your money back after you no. decide to, to 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 sell your jet ski. So it's completely it's a different to understand on that. At the same time, we understand. Let's say that ski will run 83, 84 on stock, completely completely stock. I'm not saying any any change. Uh, obviously, uh, if you compare the, um, that investment to put to go for a few more miles, that's probably not not going to make sense. But at the time you add, you compared performance about response uh, and then you add a new impeller and uh, obviously Fizzo and other guys are working on new impeller upgrades on for this. And it's very promising because of the high speed of the of the supercharger. Now it seems that it will build a lot more boost than the previous CDUs. But uh, again, the issue itself, it's a uh, it's a hardware that you can use later or you can resell or you, you, whatever you want to do, you can do. It's not something you lost. So even if you put a full package, a $3,500 full package, which, which includes our stronger igniter, our best uh, wideband reader with the touchscreen, the ECU itself, later on, that can be resold for almost full value, depends, uh, depends on, on that. Well, you're making a very good point, and I think that's something that I, I actually really like, is that if you do buy the FT550, that can be transferred to so many different applications yeah, and the, the processing power and everything that is capable within it. My first hands-on experience in using the FT 550 was actually on Greg's ski, the very one that's behind him right now. Cool. Let's actually bring Greg into the conversation. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We've been talking this whole time without you. <laughs> well, so, and one of the things that was most impressive to me was first on Greg ski was all the data gathering and you were able to show us some tables. You were able to show us a lot of data in just, in just show prep. But uh, it, in addition to that, you were able to manage to, or you managed to get your standalone, the FT 550 to, actually communicate with the factory dashboard and that all the functions were there so it's effectively reversible if you wanted mm -hmm. to sell the ski you could put everything back right yeah and um again we you don't let's say it, it doesn't even add hours to your stock issue if that makes sense uh, yeah no it makes perfect sense 
be, because the, then you really is fully reversible. It's not a single wire you need to touch or cut. You don't have, you don't have, for example, now you mentioned the Bosch issue. If you're willing to take the risk and open the issue and, re and remove and replace the processor, then you put it back. Oh. What's the risk sometimes involved on that? Uh, and so it's a, it's a different perspective. Uh, also the data logging or uh, because we're, it's not just about our oh, fuel and timing. It's about data logging. Uh, if you're if you're switching to turbo or doing any kind of different uh, setting, you, you can control nitrous uh, launch control. For example, the drag race features we, we use works. Perfectly. Can you explain lo how launch control would work for a jet ski application? Because I think that's one of the coolest things that you mentioned mm -hmm. in one of the first emails you sent me. And I was like, OK, I want oh, yeah. I want the description in the podcast. So, for example, we First, on the depends on if you're launching from a stop. Uh, we we did already for the Yamaha and the Sidu. You can actually press a two-step button. So, for example, on my Yamaha, I have the no wake button to become my two-step with my launch mode. So when I hold that, I can I can select if I want my my reverse bucket to neutral, and uh, and I select what RPM I want to limit. So if it's a turbo ski or a compound like in my case. I can I can have uh, at a 2,000 3,000 RPM whatever it doesn't move, uh, and uh, I we can control electronic blow off valves. That's also a big thing. So the electronic blow off valve is automatically open when we hit we hit the launch mode, uh, and then it bleeds out the air so the turbo is pull faster. I can go full throttle and the, the, the jet ski will not going to move because it's on neutral, and when I release the button. I, then we have a few ways of doing the traction control. One, if it's a supercharger one, you can actually manipulate the electronic throttle body if you have okay. it. Uh, so you can literally do a ramp because typically what happens depends on the horsepower. But in the first second, it, once it doesn't have really speed, you, you're going to cavitate and to no pressure go up to zero. You're going to hit the limiter and spin the tires or spin the prop. Yep. How you call. Yep. Uh, so basically, you do a pretty fine uh, curve on that. And you also can do that by G, uh, for by G meter because the ECU has internal G meter and calculates okay. this, the, the, the G meter speed. Uh, so basically, you can you can prevent it actually to spin uh, on the first uh, be, on the beginning, and you can do that by limiting the throttle. You can do that by pulling timing, or you can do that by rev limiter or a, like a predefined RPM limiter curve. Uh, and then you can even use like tunnel pressure or other or, or or any kind of sensor that will help you understanding where you actually need to slow down. And even the internal G meter on the data logging is so helpful because, for example, when I was testing my ski, uh, I really could see the G meter pull, uh, slowing down the ski when I was using the rev the, 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 the traction control. Uh, but once I actually start allowing it to go without so many so much holding the rpm it was even losing g meter so i had to find a perfect spot where i actually keep pulling the best g possible all the way to the from the lounge so those okay. were just a few examples of how you actually can, can control that uh, the other thing i believe it's going to be a game changer on the jet ski especially on the supercharger ones it's uh, the electronic blow-offs yes so this is something just came out and uh uh, OEM cars does have that for a while already, like the Ford F-150, but they do have a very small orifice blow off and it's not really capable of holding too much boost. So our, our friends at TurboSmart, I always, uh, uh, we work together very well for so long and uh, I pretty much put, a f I put two of their F-150 upgrades on my, on my Yamaha and uh, what I've done then after we figured that it will work really well, we actually, they developed a, a race version, which I had on my ski on, on, on Hydrodrax. But the biggest benefit of the electronic blow off, it doesn't depend on vacuum to actually open. So, okay. That's, yeah. that, that was going to be my question. So effectively anyone with the new 325 that does have the blow off valve, which is vacuum operated, you can replace that with say a turbo smart, mm -hmm. you know, a turbo, a turbo smart kit that's going to communicate with the FT 550. Yep. And that way you're going to be able to provide the customer with, uh, I the, presume so the a, a launch control tune. 
yeah correct but the the big the i was bringing the benefit of the electronic blow off over the vacuum operated is you don't need vacuum because the one that you need vacuum you literally have to close the throttle generate vacuum your your clutch is already kick it you already kick the clutch back yeah and then you actually opening the blow off is too late it's like 400 milliseconds it's a eternity uh, for this application on the electronic blow off before even creating any vacuum or before even dropping boost on the intake manifold you are actually opening it already and dropping the air and bleeding out the air so the supercharger will never get the kickback that obviously reduces the life of the clutch whatever, whatever right. it is so now you're saving supercharger life as well oh yeah and then we have another feature on the ecu on the fuel tech is we can set up the opening throttle body speed and the closing throttle body speed so for example we usually for better throttle response you do as fast as possible like even faster than stock uh, <laughs> if you want uh, and then when you actually close the throttle uh, you can actually close it slightly slower uh, not as much as you you feel that the, the ski is not stopping but you then you will use the the benefit of the electronic blow off to actually blitz off the boost and you see, then you slow down the ski a lot, but you you never really close too fast the throttle. So for you you also prevent some accidents like the ski maybe drop, dropping the nose too fast when you are over, yeah, is carried by something. But we will also preventing the supercharger increasing supercharger clutch life on that. Well, I'm I'm thinking of it. What's funny is that I know we 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 started by talking about CDs, but I keep thinking about. Number one problem with with high performance Yamahas is initial cavitation right out of the gate. They, you know, Yamahas mm -hmm. cavitate like monsters, and yeah. then they do nose over if you chop the throttle. Yeah, so yeah. the pump stops. Yeah, the pump uh, stops. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and I was perfect. And one reason I'm every time I I got involved on in something, I I like to go deep, and I like to learn. And uh, I learned a few times. I hit my chest and the. <laughs> On the steering wheel, I was saying, man, it, it can't be like that. You have to be such of a good driver to let off at 100 miles per hour and don't hit your chest. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was like, man, let's let's figure how to do that in a safer world. You know what I mean? So we actually did like the throttle closing speed, and then we dropped the boost. And another thing, on a I have a, on a pedaling uh, occasion. I can show you data if you guys want. On a I'd love to. If, you, if you're if you're willing to show us, I'd love to see yeah. whatever you got. Let me on a paddling occasion. There was a very nice. Uh, let me open here while we, we talk. But uh, it's very important. It is uh, here. Let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, yeah. One second. Cool. So there we go. Okay. Here we are. Okay. Can you guys see? This is this is the data log from my my Yamaha, right? Um, now, so just for everyone, just so everyone knows, Anderson has a what is it a GP? A GP eighteen hundred, yeah. GP eighteen hundred. He has a thousand horsepower GP eighteen hundred that has a turbo that force feeds the supercharger or a compound turbo. So uh, this is what we're talking about, just in case you were curious. <laughs> yeah, this is just an example. I was like full throttle here on the two step here. And uh, let me cut ignition time. But basically, once I left, in, you see in, in 1.1 1. 1. 1 second of the run, I felt I had to pedal. You see my throttle here on top. Mm. So I felt it was coming off the water. And I was making already 33 pounds of boost here. And, uh, but you, if you guys understand, you know, 77% throttle body is not enough to create, to dump, to drop boost. Usually it's, right. uh, you, you will need to go below 30%, something like that. But then I have my, the electronic blow off, which is commanded here by in green. I can see this is where the electronic blow off open. And you see my boost drop it from 34 pounds to 22 pounds of boost immediately. And uh, if you look here, this is where I start moving my my 1.12 seconds. And I can see in 1.21 is like less than 100 milliseconds later, the boost was dropping already. Uh, if it was a regular, it would take two, three tenths here to actually feel some boost 
and once I came back immediately, it's pull up again uh, very fast. So even I mean for 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 race, any kind of racing or throttle response or or if you're in a choppy water, you need to pedal and command. This is the kind of stuff that will be is definitely very very helpful. And uh, yeah, that's fantastic. you guys want to see, this also was the, the day log from the 325 on the test we did. Okay, uh, this is the 325. All right. Yeah. In this case, the heater, for example, was making 14.7 pounds of boost. Uh, it was very conservative, like 0.80 lambda here. It was, it is like 11.6. Okay. AF fair. Uh, so, have... you, what was, what was peak, what was peak, uh, peak boost on, on, on the 325 i seen i seen like 15 pounds maybe but okay. it was like okay. maybe you see uh, here is only 14 something but again the altitude in georgia it may right. be slightly different yeah uh but like and uh this this was just like like i said was testing uh, re, uh pretty much checking the the how everything was working uh, and one thing a lot of people ask uh and i think is i i, I saw some of the chat is about knock sensor right yes uh, that yeah. was actually a question that had come up and a lot of people were real concerned about knock sensors and they're like oh man yeah. even you know how, how can you how can you tune yeah. a ski without a knock sensor and i'm thinking if you're relying on a knock sensor i think you're in yeah. trouble so uh my my opinion and uh, first uh we don't have the knock sensor uh and uh the but the the most let's say the knock sensors were like a very important feature in the 90s and the early 2000s especially when you were really running running any kind of gas uh and you actually were limited of the gasoline quality and even the engine designs uh if you're considering any any fuel like ethanol or methanol obviously knock doesn't even exist no. Uh, knock is only a gasoline a specific gasoline uh, challenge and uh, right now with the good quality fuels usually you're not really close to the knock limit uh, but again i'm not saying if you have a tuner that depends on knock and on the, or la prefer how to tune on the knock or using that limit obviously there is multiple ways of achieving the same result but i i can say for sure that usually the tune-up is kind of far from the knock level and if you're actually on that level, it may be oppositely uh, in the dangerous side. Uh, but again, this is maybe uh, an opinion or maybe some perspective of the later uh, ways of tuning. And obviously, there are so many people that are tuning for 20, 30 years and they're so used to that or some of the strategies that it will be. And again, your OEM really depends on knock because you're actually having to warranty uh, an engineer for so many years or you have to warranty and guarantee whatever junk fuel the guy is in, using. You have to guarantee the, if the engine is smoking and sometimes when you actually blow buying and smoking, it will generate uh, or cause knock by some of the defects. I'm not saying it's not helpful, but it's differently, it's definitely not needed or obligated uh, on that right. perspective. And, and you were saying yourself, I mean, uh, in, in knowing and being familiar with the fuel tech resume, I'm like, these guys have been tuning twin turbo Corvettes and Ferraris and Lamborghinis and, and high end supercars that are worth the value of many of our homes. And you're not using knock sensors. So I'm, uh, <laughs> well, yeah, if you rely on a knock sensor, you're not preventing knock detonation will still happen. The knock sensor yeah. just detects it and pulls it away. So if you rely on that knock sensor, the outcome in the end will likely be the same because you're still detonating. Right. And, uh, and on a high performance application, a knock sensor is actually doing more harm than good because these performance engines are really noisy and there's a lot of false knock. Yeah. So oh, very true. Yes. If you've got false knock and you're retarding timing, you could lose a race because you're down on power. So yeah. it's not really something that's desirable that I think. And to be 100% honest, we we had a, we even we have a knock meter we call which, which was a specific product we developed a few years ago. And uh, again, don't take me wrong, we we're not perfect. I agree. If we if we want to make everyone happy, we will have a knock sensor. 
and as well as other features we may be missing. But we're trying, we understand, we, we try to simplify a lot of this stuff that in the, even the NOx settings for if you have a, a forged pistons, if you have different uh, turns, you, you're going to have be in trouble anyway, you know what I mean? So like oh, you sure. just said, you need to, you need to fine tune and sometimes if you're depending on a system that you cannot fine tuning uh, that part, you're, you're actually, you're, you're uh, the, the, the issue will be pulling timing or adjusting without really the need on that. So it, it, it becomes usually more as a complexity that uh, doesn't help that really a benefit, in my opinion. Well, let's talk about it. And I agree. Thank you very much. I, 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 I'm glad we kind of cleared that up. That was a question that came in and it was something that was really circulating today on social media it was mm -hmm. a lot of people who had shared the had shared the news and had shared the video that you had for uh, that you had put out uh, on I believe Friday was or Thursday mm -hmm. the video had come out. Um, a lot of people were like, "Well, there's no knock sensor," so oh, 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 oh. and they all you know kind of grumbled. Um, but I think what you know what was so interesting in and I think what is still very applicable and usable is the fact that. The true performance enthusiast, it's, it's, you know, entry level tuning is, can we take the speed limiter off? Mm -hmm. But yeah. we're not talking about that. We're talking guys who really are pursuing high level, high degrees of performance and really looking to excel beyond what maybe might be the stage one guy or the stage one plus guy. So, with that being said, what are, I guess, what would be some potentials that you see? Let's talk about the 325 first. And then I'd like to get into uh, the SVHOs. And you have a lot to say about the new 1.9 1. 9, 1. 9 mm -hmm. liter. So what, what, are, what are some potentials or wh where do you think the 325 can go from here? Okay, so it looks like the new supercharger is very impressive uh, the impeller size is so small and gives uh, an impression of a lot of room to make a lot of more boost so i uh, i you guys probably know better but the the rpm the top are uh, the speed the supercharger speed now is comparable to the yamaha right uh, 100,000 rpm before it was like 60 something <laughs> yeah i think it was less than that i think it was almost like 45 4500 okay 45,000 i mean yeah so definitely the the higher speed on the on the pseudo combined with uh, cap, uh let me full tuning capacity uh and that may bring the CDUs to a level where i uh, mean a boost level where the yamaha can. so i i i'm i'm also impressed at how how i mean having the wide band the stock wide band or two it it, it 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 simplifies obviously you could always add on the previous one but if you're starting some program right now uh, on a CDU platform, definitely starts with the 325 because the, there's so many, CDU did a great job bringing this news for the, the platform. It's, uh, it's impressive how that they, they thought about that, that part, especially in the electronics. And, uh, and again, back even, even of, it may be the reflash industry will probably catch up on them uh, maybe uh, sooner or later. Uh, and again, that guy that just want to remove, remove the limiter and just gain like 200 RPM, that, that guy may be obviously the best buck for the money to do a reflash. Uh, but at the same time, right now, where, while you can do any kind of reflash, even that guy that wants to do some upgrade, he will not throw the money away installing a fuel tech. It's up, up, even the opposite. He will take absolutely zero risk uh, by installing a fuel tech and running and racing and, and doing whatever he wants, a recreational. Uh, so we have so many clients that they, they're like technology inclined, inclined. Then they, wow. they love to see data logging. They love to see what's going on on the ski. So they, they, they basically install the fuel tech, not looking for much more performance, but they want to know what's going on. What's the air fuel, how they can play with that. They, they want to idle a little different. They want to, they want to do a limiter different. They do a, two step like a, uh, uh, a launch mode uh, to, to the buddies. They want to do a, even like a roll start launch on the lake. 
uh, you can come at a certain speed and pr press the two step or the button and you can go full throttle and do a, a, a rolling a roll start let's say this way uh, and doesn't really need to be all like a turbo a big turbo or big big boost supercharger you can you can play with that and later on you decide either you're going more you serious or you actually backing up and then doing another ski so i i see going back circle circle back on the 325 i think is a the best platform probably for the cdu platform to start with because you already start with so much improvements over the previous platform and the probably i think what's the maximum boost you can do on a 300 on stock supercharger with some impeller uh -huh. On the supercharger with an aftermarket impeller, the highest one is like 24 pounds boost. But the uh, when you compare that to a Yamaha, they've got aftermarket impellers at well into the 30 psi range. Just I don't know if I can say that, but Fizzo will forgive me. But uh, we're testing a 50 pounds impeller on the Yamaha right now. <laughs> well, uh, there you go. Just the, the, the supercharger we, design is so much better. I don't know if you guys saw, but we did a, a supercharger kit that uh, it's a, for the Yamaha, for the Sidu, I'm sorry, for the Yamaha with a 10, 10 millimeter shaft, a longer shaft, mm -hmm. the ball bearing, and uh, for the new SPHO. And uh, that's, that was on my ski. And I did that because I broke a couple supercharges on mine. And then we wow. decided, let, let's do an upgrade on that. But then that, that has a very tall, uh, longer shaft that you can put a huge, huge impeller to make supposedly above 50 pounds of boost so going back imagine in the supercharger from the the sidu that you can make maybe 30 40 pounds eventually on a sidu mm -hmm. that will change the game how sidu actually plays on the big power comparison right, uh, right. so i think that that's interesting uh, enough and again the the 325 there's a lot of people that will just wait until everything is figured and there's people that want to be the first ones to figure. So either you're either one or the other guy. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, and, oh, go ahead. And, you know, today the you know, between your post and the post I made last week, another one of the biggest comments was you spending $3,000 for a few more miles per hour. But, uh -huh. you know, this isn't comparable to a reflash. The stock ECU is limited as to what you can do. The data logging for aftermarket companies is limited. Yeah. Uh, Fuel tech is way ahead of the game when it comes to data logging, and that alone is worth the price. And then when you combine that with a true launch control that's tunable, um, a traction control system that you can implement into it, and uh, every other thing, the boost controller, nitrous controller, everything that Fuel tech has to offer, you will not be able to do that on a stock ECU. And that's what a lot of people didn't seem sure. to understand. So that's really uh, the biggest standout for me right now is honestly the the capability of the fuel tech to provide zero cavitation can mitigate cavitation can mitigate nose over or pump stuffing can um, provide superior launch superior acceleration crisper acceleration mm -hmm. and, and yeah you, can you might Oh, There's sorry, all, always the also the the engine protection safety features. So, mm -hmm. for example, you can select uh, your base fuel pressure. If uh, fuel pressure drops, you can e decide even to shut the engine off or limit it, or uh, or even alert on the screen. Uh, you can do the same for oil pressure. You can do the same for pretty much any any fail safe to save your engine. Uh, and uh, I don't know much on the C dos, but I know on the Yamaha the oil system is junk, so you definitely cavitates oil pressure all the time and uh, you have a lot of problems and uh, uh, I, I'm even on my ski it saved a few times my crankshaft just by <laughs> preventing it to go full throttle with uh, no oil pressure or a, a temporary uh, cavitation oil pressure cavitation so uh, that those safety safety features and I know that from the car world because again I'm oh, not yeah. new into these guys. I'm new into no. jet skis. We're new into jet skis, but we're, we're not new into this. We're over 20 years in industry for any kind of application. Uh, it just happened now that for the jet ski world, people are looking, okay, that's a new issue coming. No, that's, we're, we're doing that for a long time. No. And, and obviously there will be the guys that will prefer something very simple, stage one, um, basic. Uh, and again, even for those guys, don't take me wrong, 
uh, we sell a lot of products for those kind of applications because it makes sense of so data logging. It, you always get your money back in the end. It's not something that you're really spending and throwing. It's different than spending three thousand dollar in a in a in a broken part or a tire or fuel something that we are not recovered like a an issue. We have we have few tech issues being sold. A ten year old issue being sold for seventy percent of the original price uh, later on. So yeah, but why sell it? Hang on to it and take the harness, take take all the parts that you put onto your c or your Yamaha and guys hang on to there. Uh, right now, my understanding or, or the, the industry numbers are is that uh, a, a person typically he- holds on to a personal watercraft between four and six years. And so if a guy's like, hey, listen, I'm going to I'm going to step up to the new, you know, like you said, the new 350 or the new whatever he mm-hmm. can take that that engine controller and go from c to Yamaha, contact Fuel Tech and say, this is what I got going on. And they can get a tune from you guys. Yeah, the tune is available on the on the software open. For yeah. All of them. yeah. And, and all uh, of a sudden now his previous c ECU is now on a new Yamaha. Yeah. And he's off and he's off and going. And there is also there's you know even the ECU has three tune-ups you can store, so even if you have let's say uh, kids driving my jet ski tune-up or <laughs> or you have uh, I mean a drag version or or buddies or but you also can have the same ECU on your truck uh, pulling your ski or same same to, same ECU you just pull from the ski and put in your UTV your camera. Oh. Uh, <laughs> that's true that's true yeah, or you can even have let's say you have two three skis and you don't really we don't run them all the time you pull from one one and put in the other one and literally with a click on the button when the, uh, you don't have you don't have to retune or reflash anything and even so it can store multiples it can store yeah. multiple vins you can keep three tune-ups uh three, three, okay. two, three tune-ups doesn't matter if it's for the same vehicle or different vehicle you can also have tune-ups oh, for just like different perspective let's say or or a valet tune up uh, yeah. valet tune up uh, tuning if you want to have somebody else driving on a different level um that kind of stuff see that was one of the most interesting things in 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 reading up on on the ft 550 was was that it didn't imprint on okay i can only operate on this one vehicle whatever it is whether it's your truck your utv your your watercraft whatever it doesn't lock itself in on that one particular unit you can literally pull it off your truck and put it on your ski and yeah yeah even wow. even stuff like the next update is where we're going to uh, release a few new new features like the like i was mentioning the electronic blow off control we're controlling what uh, we're, we're incorporating water methanol injection uh which is very interesting. Uh, a lot of people don't pay attention, but even on a jet ski, you have free water. Yeah. <laughs> you may be considering <laughs> that. Uh, and uh, we are incorporating, and those are all free updates. So over the last 10 years, we've been updating our current platform with new updates, new firmware, new ideas. Uh, even the the idea of using the, the, the IBR or the ride module to put in neutral during launch mode, that came out from we're like oh we're talking what if we do that oh man that, that actually may help especially from a from a, a from a drag race perspective where you actually can have the, the neutral uh, there so that kind of stuff is relevant another example you guys know very well Brian Kirschberger right mm-hmm. uh, he he when we met him a year ago pretty much he was always easily tuning through stock ECU or, or Motec or, or other ECU or pretty much of those. And uh, even him, uh, I, I think he did the other day the accounting. He, he already tuned and installing over 35 on on, on that. Uh, and that, uh, and he even mentioned that uh, it's so quick to actually from first start to actually delivery, it's so quick on the tuner side because he already, first is the, the output correction is super helpful. It does really take care for you. You don't have to keep looking and refreshing or waiting or, or even the, the process between up saving what you're doing or doing live tuning. That resumes so, so much. You can really do 
uh, in the tuner perspective, and we hear that from the car world as well. Uh, the tuner perspective, you you can really do a lot more. You know, the tuners that have been working with us, they they're so happy because they say, "Man, I I get the product, I plug in. There's no no problems. If I have any questions, I call you guys on the tech support. Talk to you guys. Uh, you guys, I mean, we always have a. I mean, a, a, we try to do our best to help, no matter if if it's a fuel tech problem or a fuel tech question. We try to make you the client or the tuner to be very assertive, and then the client goes away, and then you have data logging. If the client is far away from your your tuner, you can remote connect with a incorporated software that we have that you really, the client just hooked up a laptop and then you can remotely connect to the EQ and and check the data log, see what's going wrong and tell, oh yeah, you have a oil pressure problem or you have this problem and then fix or uh, or not, or, or really instead of having, oh, ship this key to me, let me put on the water, I have no data logging of when that happened. And then you really go take longer to really diagnostic. So, if you look by that perspective, if you have a, a jet ski with fuel tech, to, the diagnostic is so much easier as well. So. Question for, for people who are curious, because I think a lot of this has been a, specifically a conversation about the benefits of that standalone ECU, was if a person, if a customer comes in and purchases the FT550, he's able to reach out to your customer service and say, hey, listen, I'm very interested in a launch control feature or a traction control feature um what can you send me and that that data file do you guys have that data file it's, on hand uh, no it's even easier we for example uh, uh, another example i will use from from brian he even called me the other day saying or uh he was testing a thing angelica's ski and he okay. said oh yeah i'm testing here a uh, uh, new traction control that i watched the video of a bike guy which was a uh, bike guy did a video explaining how to do the, the traction control. Uh, and he just translated that to the water. Uh, and uh, so that's one example. But obviously, we have tech support. If you call our tech support, say, hey, I want to do that. It's not just a file. It's really an explain. This is what you want to do. Do you have a data log of the, this key? And usually with the, data, the client's data log, we can actually pinpoint, OK, oh. this is where you probably need to control looking by the data, the G-meter, uh, and teach the guy how to do. That's how oh, we, okay. we do. And uh, it, because we don't offer tuning services, uh, we don't compete with the tuners. Uh, obviously, we can assist and teach and, and explain as much as we can. But uh, the, is, uh, if, if the tuner wants to, we just explain how, how you can achieve what you're looking for. So usually, if you, if you call us with a problem, say, oh, I need I need help with some kind of traction control. So we we discuss together. Okay, what you guys? Let me let's see a data log. Okay, it seems that this the, the time based rev limiter may actually work for you, or the the throttle, or using if you're using mechanical throttle because a lot of people don't know, but you you can use mechanical throttle if you prefer that with the fuel tech and even keep the ride or the IBR uh, functionality uh, using the mechanical throttle body. So that's another. Uh, example how flex the flexibility it is okay okay well i think we've talked a lot about cdu you told you shared something rather interesting was um just recently you experienced something that a lot of these performance guys with yamahas have experienced and cracked the cylinder head of your uh yeah. 1.8 liter yeah so, so what did you do after that? <laughs> okay, so it happened that I'm learning what's the weak points of each combo, right? And everyone, I mean, seems that to be seems that to, this is a very common thing, not only for heavily modified, but even some stock 1.8 liter heads actually being cracking around the the head studs on the on the corner, right? Uh, so I had a brand new 2024 1.9 HO, which I I have zero hours on the water actually. By the way, we the same we did on the Yamaha on the Sidu, we did for the 1.8 liter on the plug and play. Oh. Okay. The difference is Yamaha have not changed the issue. So it was easier because it was the same plug and play from the 2023 Yamaha. But the Yamaha did change the crank trigger. So now it's not the the four plus one, is a 24 minus two on the new Yamaha. Oh. So 
that's actually a huge news i hate those four plus one <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the the new 24 minus two has so much more resolution for timing for starting for anything on the yamaha uh so that also it's a it's a good improvement on the yamaha side uh but that also brings back that you cannot run uh 2023 issue on the 2024 yamaha because they will not right. uh share the same crank trigger uh so once we figured that we, we put the, the that and the new seven inch screen we made it to work as well with the can bus so it's a nice screen you can keep that and keep the ride module but then then i i came back from from hydro drags and i have the crack cylinder head uh, cylinder head cracked on my 1.8 liter and we look for the yamaha or we look for the yamaha so we decided to pull the head so i have some images here i think it would be interesting to share with you guys let me share my screen absolutely one second um so the as i understand the weakest point on the on the on the yamaha is uh it's this this wall here it's on the one point leader is seven millimeters only and uh, it's even get thinner here is is and this is the 1.9 liter head and it has 13 millimeters so it definitely uh indefinitely more than it, it double the wall on this sides and it, it's all for every single one so then we started adapting this on my 1.8 block uh and one difference here i don't know if you can see the the, the differences to adapt is you can actually you see this hole where i'm pointing the mouse can you see that or no yes yeah we can see it that is the gallery that comes here of oil for the tensioner the 1.9 okay. tensioner uh so it's instead of having an external line it goes internally uh but this actually has a, a wider area here where if you look on the head gasket not this no not this <laughs> oops uh, uh if you look for the head gasket here uh, is this area here can you see that mm, it's uh, still the same yet. thing okay let me present again yeah because you had showed us the difference in the in the head gasket here we are okay so this is the on the top is the 1.8 liter head gasket and the bottom is the 1.9 head gasket so this additional area here it's actually to block uh machining pass through oil for the tensioner so if you're actually using a 1.9 head on the 1.8 you need to to block you need to actually block this gallery inside here and use an external uh line for and the old 1.8 tensioner or the mechanical whatever you're using on the ten, on the on the chain tensioner um here and uh so this has the the wider walls here also the other side of the head uh let me see if the other side of the head oh the ports obviously are different intake ports we actually have to do a a conversion flange from one to the other we might uh, need to change out your screen oh, okay because we're, we're we still have the head gasket shot there I'm we go sorry. oh no you're fine you're fine you just want to follow along yeah <laughs> uh -huh. oh, okay i know what i'm doing wrong i need to share entire screen not that okay yes so so also the let me show the the camshafts are raised about one to 1.5 millimeter so you okay. need to use taller shims but you can use the previous camshaft so these camshafts are like 32 millimeter uh cent uh diameter you uh, can use the one eight camshafts yes i have on wow. mine I, I just put the one eight the I, I use the webcams uh so i just need to shim you need to shim more the valves but the valves are exactly the same the valve the 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 springs and the retainers everything the same as the 1.8 but the okay. camshaft so is the, raised 
Okay, so the benefits then of running the 1.9 liter would give you improved intake runners. Yes. And, um, and use of the new 1.9 liter intake manifold. Correct. Yeah, correct. Okay. The exhaust is also short. Is, is yes. Uh, it's closer together, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't matter. It's one. I think it's one millimeter smaller size, but not a really big difference. Uh, obviously, the 88 millimeter piston here, but nothing much to to the difference than that. The, but you are getting the benefit of the thicker cast he cylinder head. Oh yeah, I, I I believe the the biggest benefit is definitely the is definitely the head uh, improve the materials here. You can see, you can definitely see it's all even here. I don't know if you saw between in runners. It's 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 very beefy, very 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 beefy. Here you can see that. And uh, the the other corner, this corner of the gasket here. Let me show here. Uh, this corner of the gasket here is also different. Uh, yes. So this is the 1.9, and this is the 1.8. But if you're using the 1.8 block, you have to use the 1.8 gasket. But basically, that's those are the differences. Okay. Now you haven't done any testing yet with the 1.9 liter head on your no because uh, the intake manifold we're actually we need to do also a, a flange to fit the old intake manifolds uh and also i need to fabricate the new exhaust I, i'm using the stock exhaust header uh really? and, and okay. because it fits on my turbo kit i still use the water jacket header uh so that definitely fits and, and makes so i i'm shooting for two or three weeks to be running my and see yeah, how okay yeah. that's awesome yeah. that's really impressive man <laughs> well normally around this time we start taking super chat questions but for the life of me we haven't had a single one come in uh, <laughs> i think i think you've been so thorough you've answered everyone's questions but greg i didn't know if you wanted to jump in at all i don't i i feel like you've been quiet this whole time yeah well you know anderson said pretty much everything that i would have had to say but uh, uh as far as adding to that nothing really you know uh, getting the the 1.9 hit on the 1.8 i i really think that's going to be a really nice upgrade for everyone that wants to keep their 1.8 and does have the head cracking issue because uh yamaha has taken measures to address this with the uh, the newest 1.8 head casting but they still crack um so being that you figured out a 1.9 head onto the 1.8, it's definitely nice. And also, because if you're actually using the 1.9 block, you, you have a, a, a two millimeter, a two extra millimeter piston. So it means we have mm -hmm. a weaker um, wall, a cylinder. Uh, yeah. So it, it may be the best combination for re extreme high horsepower use the 1.8 block to 1.8 mm -hmm. one head. We had uh, we had Ernesto here from Callus World. He was uh, very excited to be in the chat. Uh, yeah. He was answering some questions for people. He wasn't asking questions for us though. But <laughs> yeah. uh, he he wanted to thank everyone for being here tonight and being able to talk about the talk about everything that was available through Fuel Tech. Um, I, I I was hoping just for. Uh, one post that i could throw up but he's been he, he's been very he's been very talkative so yeah. well, <laughs> so thank you, know, you ernesto for being in the chat well, speaking of ernesto i met him last year in thailand and you know what you see on his youtube channel is how he is in real life you know he's a <laughs> he's, a, he's a great guy and uh yeah. if you have not watched his youtube channel you should go watch it because uh you know he's got probably the jet the best jet ski content on youtube definitely worth watching yeah yeah and he's he shared so much as well and we we i love to talk to him because he's mm -hmm. he's no he knows everyone he 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 learns he usually he understands everything so it's so much knowledge for even for us again we're we're definitely listening to to everyone now it's a, and and again we're we're entering let's say the jet ski world and there's so much we need to learn there's so mm -hmm. much we we can 
improve and uh, I'm happy to be part of it and honestly happy in such a in pretty much one amazing year to be we're actually able now to supply pretty much every single uh, combination necessary even even the old CDUs we just came out with a plug and play for the 2008 and older uh, CDUs and uh, that's interesting because that you don't have electronic throttle body so you can use a FT450 so ah. the kit the kit goes way I mean on a thousand dollar range for the full setup mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people actually oh. using that you you have a plug and play harness for the 08 yeah older Siemens ECU yeah uh huh is that on your website yet or, or honestly let me see but I we do we, we did have that uh, uh we did you know, it's, it's not on the website yet but we have in stock already and we for that we oh. had to we have to 3d print the connector for that Siemens issue because there's no okay. no, no connector for that yeah uh, but that that harness is available we have a few in stock already okay I'm going to email you tomorrow about this <laughs> so I, I literally true. have an 08 sitting in my garage and it you know working with the stock Siemens ECU it's driving me absolutely nuts because it it's uh even worse than the 300 ECU <laughs> yeah uh, yeah so we did the the 08 CDU pretty much every single 300 or 260 or, or all those uh, obviously the 325 on the Yamaha obviously the two plug or the the three plug ride or no ride no matter mm -hmm. and we did also the the stand-up Kawasaki the 1500 we even have a okay. few running at Hava, Lake Havazu a few weeks ago uh, on that. So we're pretty much covering most of the the, the jet ski in, in in one year. Pretty much, I was was very happy to to see that happening. <laughs> yeah, that's fantastic. You know, uh, and I, you know, I was t when Kevin was at Mudbug a few weeks ago, I was talking to him a little bit. And I, I was telling them when you have a, a CEO or a business owner that's passionate about what they do, you know, they end up doing great things. And I think you're a prime example of that because at the end of the day, it seems like this is not just a paycheck for you. You're right. out there testing, tuning, trying new things. And, uh, you know, I think there's great things to come from fuel tech in the end because of it. Yeah, absolutely. That's usually how we do every single uh application we have people that is passionate about the about something mm -hmm. and uh, that's how we're doing on drag race bikes we are doing on on diesel now uh, we're doing on the jet ski world and we have usually one at least one of our guys really passionate about something and we always say man you have to fight for that you need to go over it's not mm -hmm. it's not try to see if it works it's try until it works it's, yeah it's different it's make it happen, make it happen. Mm -hmm. So that's how we've been approaching and we understand really what, I mean, that's how we have to do. I mean, how, how you need to make better every day and uh, really take care of that. All right, guys, we got a super chat. This is from Mikey. Mikey writes, I'm a lay person when it comes to engines, I'm trying to learn, are standalone ECUs IGSBA legal? Because uh, Mikey has been, uh, jumping into buoy course racing and close course racing in fact mikey was probably our most prolific questioner during our dustin farthing interview um but my understanding is that a standalone ecu is only legal outside of the stock class i believe limited class pro class and gp i know for certain gp and i believe pro class but I'm on the fence about limited, but I certainly know that stock class is not, you, you would have to use a, uh, um, a SCOM is, or a speed control override is legal, but you have to have the factory ECU. I don't know if you have encountered anything else. Um, I've, uh, I think what you say is correct. It's pro it, it, it does really depend on each class and the regulations. Right. You have to read that through. Uh, though, and I, uh, this you'll have to laugh, but uh, or you'll laugh at this one. But uh, my my understanding of the IGSBA rule book in regards to standalone ECUs is based upon like the 2008, 2009, 2010 advent of the Motex first being introduced to the Yamahas with the SHO engines, because that was really the only way that people were getting any sort of power out of the SHOs was getting their getting a Motec on there. And uh, I, I'd have to go back and freshen up on 
the rule book, which no you one know, wants to do. One thing that happens a lot in other sanctioning bodies that they don't allow standalone, uh, they usually, if they want to develop the, 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 the race vehicle uh, and they use a standalone uh, for testing, so they are they can do quicker changes they can try different things easier then they implement that in some older fashion into the stock issue sometimes either by external controlling or something like that or even if they just need data log so usually yeah. there's a lot of people that does like that very good uh we have another one uh this is <laughs> we can all get into this one what is the difference between ethanol and methanol Okay, ethanol, ethanol, obviously, the, my son's phone is ringing, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, we all have the same ringtone. <laughs> yeah, the, my, the, I mean, in terms of tuning, ethanol, methanol will take a 50% extra more fuel volume to get to the same air fuel. So you need to have, uh, obviously, larger injectors, larger fuel pump to get to the same. Uh, methanol it's uh it's only it only depend it, it's not susceptible of pre-ignition like by air temperature it even actually likes hot air uh because it atomizes better and methanol is you tune as the linear as the linear as possible to not have any any hot surface inside of the combustion chamber typically a spark plug so in a naturally aspirated methanol engine you tune to to let's say 12 six 13 air fuel uh in a turbocharger you go down to 90 or even richer than that it's like eight five air fuel if you if you're using air fuel gasoline or 0.55 lambda so methanol gives you a wider window to really go high boost ethanol it's a um, slightly mixed it doesn't allow to it will miss misfire if you go that rich so the power limit on an ethanol engine is a slightly less than a methanol, but obviously it's easier because you don't need that much fuel volume. For example, my my compound ski, I, I run uh, ethanol C85. Uh, C85, okay. C85 from VP Fuse uh, okay. because I personally like the combination of uh, having the 15% race fuel on it and uh, the 85% ethanol. Uh, but I also run a uh, electric fuel pump, which is also one of my limitations. Uh, so I, I cannot run methanol on a mechanic of an electric fuel pump, even being right. a, a large air motive uh, brushless, but it's still not enough. Yeah, I ran I ran VP C85 on a uh, Coyote motor that I helped build yeah. and made 11. I think we made 1160 on that. That was a that was a hell of an engine. OK, yeah. uh, we have we have a yeah, couple let more. Me ask you one. Hunter. Yes, sir. Hunter uh, asked if you have the ASAC XR plug and play kit available. Yes, we have available, but it's not on the website yet. But if you guys, if you call any of our dealers or call FuelTech USA, we can we can already sell on that. Uh, it's already available. So you have Kawasaki applications then? Yeah, the stand up. Yeah, the SXR. Okay. Well, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure the well I don't know. Well, that's not true. Um, maybe the STX because that is running the same naturally aspirated engine and does not have the in engine management that the new ultras do because mm -hmm. i believe they have a different ecu and different harness for the full-size ultras yeah um, i don't see uh we were just waiting somebody to ask for an ultra plug and play to actually do one. <laughs> oh well greg wants to build a turbo yeah it's on the list <laughs> i've got it I've got a list of projects this long. <laughs> One of them is behind me. I got a few more in my garage, but uh, we don't trick it on to it. Ultras on the list. Yeah. One yeah, day, we, someday. We just needed the excuse to that. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Which, uh, uh, we got, we yeah. have a super chat, but it's not a question. But he says, Anderson, please bring the guys from the Watercraft Journal to some <laughs> jet ski races in Brazil. As the same you did with Sean and da yeah. Daddy Dave from Street Outlaws. Yeah, be you got you brought the Street Outlaws guys down to some races. Yeah, they 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 went in 2019 for a big big festival over there. It was was so fun, and and now actually we just announcing tomorrow, uh, Daddy Dave sold his uh, old the Goliath for a Brazilian, 
and he's actually coming to pick up the car this weekend so it'll be fun <laughs> really wow yeah. Yeah. very cool I, I don't I don't think I'd survive very good in Brazil first. Yeah. Yeah, no, but... we, you know you know I'm the fastest ski in Brazil with 99 miles per hour <laughs> you, well there you go <laughs> that's the record over there <laughs> Uh, yeah. yeah, you don't want me down there. You need some of the. You need you need uh, the the guys from uh, CRT and all those dudes down there. Yeah, but actually, all, they'll, they'll let, let me let me show you guys. Let me show something different. Some since we're talking about development, uh, let me show you what we've done on the also on the Yamaha work. Um, we just uh, have a new oil pan. I don't know if you saw that. No. A billet oil pan. Oh, oh, sorry. I saw your your screen just popped up. Let me let me bring this up. Okay. Wow. Okay. So this was I when I started running my ski and checking data log. I was like, what What the hell is happening with the oil cavitation? Is that normal like that? And I start asking everyone, and I say, oh yeah, uh, when you deceleration and under deceleration, it will cavitate some. But then I figured like doing some small turns was doing some, it was so unpredictable or even bad. So it was cavitating oil pressure. So we went and designed this, this racing oil pan. I mean, uh, and the difference is if it fits 10 quarts of oil, uh, it does wow. have, I mean, pretty much stock pickup, use the stock oil pump, everything. Uh, and does have a plug here that we can actually run a hose if you want to really drain perfectly your oil pan. Uh, has uh, and then has all the flaps here. So yeah, okay. So you have trap doors in it. Okay. Yeah, trap doors here. If the oil can't get seen, and you see there's walls here. We pretty much use the design that is used in endurance racing, like uh, GT uh, style vehicles. Yeah. And and put this, and by having four extra quarts of oil, also helps uh, keeping the oil healthy and all that. And uh, actually, Jose was using that on the on the 142 miles per hour run. So you well. were you were seeing you were seeing like heavy windage or aeration of the oil oh, yeah. or badly. If you, I was even curious how people don't see that too much because let me see, let me find a data log where I can show you one second. Um, because it's impressive how every time you deceleration, you 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 actually see. Uh, let me see now, so, and, and that's that's a billet that's a CNC billet pan, or is that cast? Yeah, billet. Yeah, okay, billet. it also it also has a structural, uh, structural uh, features Bracing. of hel uh, helping okay. the block. So, here, let me let me open up your, your page okay. here. Here we go. So, for example, this this is a data log from my ski, like doing 10,300 RPM, 50. 52 pounds of boost here, actually 53. Uh, but the you see oil pressure here. You see here when this sells, you see my in green. Let me. So under boost was only making like 40, 50 pounds. And even acceleration here, it was, you see the line is kind of choppy. I don't know if yeah. you, can, you can see. That choppy is actually cavitating or aerating the fuel uh, then you see when decelerating here the oil pressure sure or the oil the, it, oil. Yeah, the green is the oil yeah okay green is oil okay sorry let sorry. me change now to red so this is oil pressure here you see how bad it comes and goes yeah. down and up and down and i can open i can open as many logs you want here uh they will always do the so same. it's just foaming the hell out of the oil is actually yeah it's picking up air a lot of the times and once air goes into the into the uh, here the, another one here on uh, this one i had like you see my tunnel pressure here on yeah. the channel here the tunnel pressure was 28 pounds and then start going down but this was because i had stock hole on the ski yet mm -hmm. okay. and trying to make 40 50 pounds of boost in stock hole so it's kind of <laughs> stupid but i was learning that's and, testing but, you're good but you see here the then the oil cavitation going like 10 pounds 17 pounds and coming back and badly every time it decelerates it goes like that and uh now this is the for example the let me see oil pressure. 
Let me see. And it wasn't the oil being superheated. It was being aerated. Now, was it being aerated by... by and t- it, hey, look who it is. Hey, what's up, guys? What's up? <laughs> hey, Anderson. How are you? How are you? <laughs> Good to see you, man. <laughs> yep. So it was now what what was caught was the windage being caused by not being a deep enough pan? Yeah, and, and because the, the, if you look the the, the the stock oil pan design, uh, all that box in the, in the center, uh, the box in the center doesn't have um the stock box here is yeah. all closed 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 okay okay and the, if you this cell all the all the oil goes to the front and the only way to get inside here is through the back if you have uh try to find a try to find an oil pen a stock oil pen design you can see that yeah uh, so another thing we also by removing the stock uh resonators on the hole you actually get a couple extra quarts of oil uh, volume wow. as well. Uh, but here, for example, this is, let me see. See, this is my oil pressure now. The green line here, you can totally see. Totally consistent. Yeah. Yeah. You see even, even deceleration here, it always like flat. You see no, no oil drop, no oil pressure drop at all. That pan is absolutely... A must-have for, I would say, almost anyone. Your extra yeah, capacity. Honestly, I, I was thinking the same because I was even talking to very experienced racers. I'll say, how do you guys fix the the problem? Oh, yeah, we just put more clearance. I say, no, man, that's that's wrong. <laughs> no. it's, it's, it, I mean, you, no. you need to fix the oil starvation. Clearly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're <laughs> you're absolutely foaming the oil. Yeah. And okay. the, the stock oil. Wow. Comes, yeah. The stock oil and and I I will I will actually give another um, another um, spoiler, but we're designing a replacement oil pump for the Yamahas that will be race oil with the incorporated fuel pressure. I mean, fuel mechanical fuel pump in the front. Uh, ah. So then you pull the stock oil pump, which is with the five star design, old style, mm-hmm. 1974, and put a race gear. Uh, oil okay. pump with external regulator so yeah you know my dad just brought up my dad jerry uh he just brought up a good point we've been having a lot of issues with supercharger shafts failing and mm-hmm. uh you know it shows a lack of oil pressure and it's probably happening during these momentary situations yeah. where you you yeah. the oil starving uh the oil pumps cavitating and the pressure drops it's probably what's wiping out these superchargers because i mean it's total the shaft's not physically breaking, but mm-hmm. it's uh, bearings wiped out, thrust washers yeah. wiped out, yeah. and pushing into the, the impeller pushes into the housing. Uh, and, you know, that's probably what's causing it. So being able to utilize that oil pump and eliminate the uh, oil starvation issue, you know, even for uh, a, a ski that's not modified very much, yeah. it can help that because, uh, you know, it's, it's maintaining the oil pressure. And Greg just said that the the 1.9 liter runs one quart less. Yeah, yeah, it does. And they have the same oil, and they have the yeah. same oil pan, so and, it's unbelievable. Yeah, it's the same oil pan, same oil pickup, same oil pump, yeah. but just a longer dipstick to reach down into the pan, which I, uh, you know, I never liked that change, and I think it's just an environmental thing. Uh, but it's the exact but, opposite of what the engine needs. Right, you know. The, I don't think you can ever, I don't think there's a, a, a con to having too much, uh, a pan with too much oil capacity. Yeah. yeah. Let, let me show you. And better windage control. Yeah. yeah. If you share, let me share the, for example, this is the stock oil pan. Okay? Yeah. Uh, it's a me, solid plate. Okay. Yeah. First, you lose all these areas here with oil volume because of the resonators. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then the second, let me try to find uh one that is open actually with this cover removed uh, here i'm glad you found that yeah so you see this this is the only way of oil gets in is through these sides oh this is the oh my gosh you know what i mean so if you have no circulation yeah so you're decelerating the oil will never get in again you know what i mean yeah 
especially if it's being whipped around and it's totally aerated, it's not going to get into yeah. that chamber. Yeah. So you actually the only if 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 you're actually this is the front of this key, okay? So you're actually if if you're decelerating, the oil goes through the outside to, all to the front, and this gets dry. So you need to really wait until you stop almost to the oil gets back here to the suction tube, which is also the suction tube is not really proper because it's just a it's just like a, it doesn't have the 90 degree uh, thing to suck mm -hmm. from the bottom with the the filter. So that's how we actually if you look here we did a it's a 90 degree suction tube here inside uh with the flaps so all the oil that is gets here there's only way in which is inside here all the oil is through the side there's a a lower entry lower entry and also this but if they're if they're decelerating these flaps will not open to the other side they actually protect it, it to, to jump on that side oh my gosh that is fantastic that, is, that this is send me a press release i want to share this on the magazine yeah. please yeah we even have here some of the text where right where on. is it on the website i want to find it uh performance parts we actually inaugurating the department of of selling these parts because this was originally i designed this to my ski i thought okay i, I could not find anybody who done that so okay i'll do myself <laughs> then we, let, let's let's Build do oil it. pan pwc okay i'm doing i'm doing a press release next week on this <laughs> Yeah, that's this is the this is the damn coolest thing. I I didn't I had no idea this thing existed. Yeah, no, and we did this in a few weeks actually. That's usually how the development is happening. Is like we we have a problem, we try to find a solution, understand the problem, and obviously design something. But <laughs> see, here's the here's the thing. Without without your data gathering, yeah, without the information that you're that the that the the fuel tech ECU was gathering, you wouldn't have known this. Yeah. So quite literally your ECU is saving Yamaha engines. And I, I truly believe in the, on the, oil ass on the Yamaha, on this one, but that's amazing. The other problem <laughs> the oil pump on, on the Yamaha oil pump is uh, that design. The current design is, is, is the worst design to actually have air. Because once the air gets in, that it it, it lose it lose pressure. So even if you run an accumulator, we, like some people use it on the '90s on their race cars, the accumulator yeah. still keeping the air pressurized. You don't want to air pressurize to loop your engine. You want oil pressurizing, pressurized oil, not air, not pressurized air. You know what I mean? So if you're running the the regular, uh, all just the what do you call the the accumulator? The accumulator uh -huh. will keep pressure, but air pressure, not oil pressure, because it really, once you actually suck the air, there's only way out for the air, which is pretty much almost going through the bearings or somewhere. So the other problem with the stock uh, oil pump is the pressure. It's unacceptable on engine revving 12,000 RPM and only having like 56 yeah. pressure. It's, uh, it's unbelievable how it still survives the most of the time, but not really for a long time. So... But if you actually put more oil pressure on the regulator, you, a Yamaha oil pump has a bad problem where the shaft doesn't have any bearing to the housing. The housing is aluminum housing, and uh, and if you actually prove if you push too much pressure and the the oil pump shaft gets stuck on the aluminum housing because there's no lubrication or there's no ma proper metal like there's no like a bearing on the right, aluminum okay. shaft. Or on the shaft, so it was, then you actually break the the oil, the oil pump gear because it just got stuck on the on the hole of the house. Oh, it welds itself to it. Yeah, exactly. So you need oh to really gosh. redesign the oil pump mm -hmm. into something that you have like a racing oil pump, like a gear driver and an external yeah. regulator. But then another problem on the Yamaha is the speed. the The oil pump speed is eighty percent, if I'm not mistaken, of the engine crankshaft. So usually when you do a racing oil pump, uh, oil pump, you need to do like half speed. So we need to we needed to adjust some gears, gearing to adjust the oil pump speed, and then we can actually as a bonus have a, a fuel pump on 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 the front of that. So you can have a mechanical fuel pump on there if you want. Wow. So uh, that oil pump that y'all are working on, what pressures are you know, targeting or getting with it? Whatever you want, because that's like a really really high volume. Um, 
oil pump for race cars. We use that okay. on, on a V8, whatever. So if you want to put 150 pounds of oil pressure, it's up to you. <laughs> the yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's much better than it because this one behind me at, I think, uh, 9,300 RPM, it's making 52 PSI of oil pressure, yeah. which, like you said, it's just, it's not acceptable for that high of RPM. Yeah, exactly. Same as mine. Mine is making 52 as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what the Yamaha will usually do. You can shim a little more, but then you get the risk of cracking and breaking the shaft. Yeah. 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 You're putting too much heat through it. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, we're at an hour and a half, and that this has been totally awesome. I mean, I've really enjoyed this. Um, Another. Let, let me show you something else. Okay. You, okay. I was going to wrap up, but okay. Yeah. Because uh, let me just find a picture. I don't know if you guys saw. We did an intake manifold, a billet intake manifold, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, TTR from Dubai. They they've been in business and doing very very nice stuff. But let me show you my the data log of my engine here. And you, about one second. Let me just find it. The individual cylinder trim is unbelievable. And this was for Yamaha as well. Yeah. Okay. One second. Dude, Greg, that the shaft failure thing mm -hmm. makes yeah. total sense right. if it's starving the oil out. Mm -hmm. Holy mm -hmm. crap. Which uh, I'm going to let Anderson pull up this manifold stuff up, but I'm going to add to that. <laughs> so here, here, this is a data log from my ski. Uh, let me clear some stuff. So I have, for example, I have here, TP, uh, obviously, 3PS, uh, Boost, uh, here is like this was making 40 pounds on this airfield turbo speed on this the compounds on 91,000 uh, one speed but this is one I want to show so this is the EGTs uh, here. you see here they come up quickly and uh, mm -hmm. they get together like very 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 closely mm -hmm. very closely uh, let me see if something else interesting here I have the intercooler temperature before intercooler after. Uh, it, it was too, I had another another log was 290 degrees before intercooler, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, 105 after intercooler. Or and, after. Uh, and what boost pressure is that? This was 40 pounds, 41. Okay, which uh, you know that just shows how efficient those fizzle intercoolers are, oh, yeah. because I'm at. 21 pounds of boost max on the one behind me and intake oh, yeah. air temps 104 degrees oh here wow. so okay. this is um 293 degrees fahrenheit mm -hmm. this was a 44 pounds of boost you see 200 yeah. degrees and then after intercooler was 120. okay so you're double the boost pressure but only 15 degrees hotter on yeah. intake air temp so you know that speaks volumes for the intercooler Dude, that's yeah. bitching uh the, the but, oil pressure you mentioned this is another yeah. 51 52 and see flat mm -hmm. here now not to get away from this data log but can you pull up a picture of the manifold that you're running yeah let me grab one second blood candle <laughs> smoke from my let candle me... <laughs> sorry mm -hmm. God. Yeah, that's this is impressive. That's impressive. 44, 44 psi and a and a hundred and you said 140 degrees, 120 120. degrees. 120. Wow. Okay, share screen. So this is a Oh, here it is. Sorry. You I, see? That's my job. Here you go. Oops. I got it. I got it. It's my bad. Okay. No, yeah. So this is the inside of the intake mm -hmm. manifold. It's all wearing uh, carbon fiber velocity stacks and mm -hmm. in a proper angle. Uh, all designed. Let me grab another. 
And it's a two piece. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, you know, the, the thing I really wanted to point out here is you mentioned how even the cylinders were yeah. as far as fueling wise. Mm -hmm. But if you look at where the throttle body is placed on this versus with the stock SVHO manifold, oh, yeah. the stock SVHO manifold basically blows air into the middle two runners yeah. and it causes a, a leaner condition in cylinders two and three compared to one and four. That's uh, how. That's why I changed mine because I had, right. I had my uh, stock location intake manifold, and I was not being, I was not happy to having to trim, eight percent plus in the in two cylinders and other than the other right. one. Uh, yeah, because it, it, it's physically flowing more air to cylinders two and three, yeah. so you know you got to compensate with fuel and and having an intake manifold where you're almost identical to airflow, you know. But then yeah. when you have, if you have too much individual cylinder trim in an engine, mm -hmm. even if you fix the tuning, your engine is still making more horsepower in a few cylinders, which, right. on, a, which on a thousand plus horsepower, you don't want mm -hmm. that because that, yeah. that's going to unbalance the crankshaft. And then you crack the crankshaft and you, mm -hmm. you have other vibration problems or resonance. And, right. and that's and really well, you need you an need an sensor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, if you crack a crank, at uh, you know, 50 pounds of boost and 130 miles an hour, you're stuffing the pump and you're going over the bar. So oh, yeah, yeah. beyond, uh, aside from having uneven horsepower, it becomes a safety issue at that point. Yeah. Uh, so you know that that style manifold uh, across the board is is more beneficial than what is equipped on a stock SVHO. Yeah. Now that manifold's so. not available on the website, right? It, it will be. We have already, we have them in stock. So we'll be actually, uh, we, we were adding those stuff over this week, but I wasn't expecting to show everything today. So we got, <laughs> you guys got a lot of uh, uh, spoilers here. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's fine. Yeah. Man, I'm going to have to get you guys an ad campaign so we can start doing monthly articles. Holy crap. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff coming out on this. Hey, uh, we got one question, and it wouldn't be, it, it would not be a podcast with the Watercraft Journal if we weren't asked what kind of oil to run. Um, not joking. Kevin sure. is asking, what kind of oil do you use on these kinds of racing skis? A thinner, thicker, heavier oil? He, I think this, I, I, I think he legitimately is asking. I don't think it's a joke, but um, what do you run in in a thousand? What kind of oil do you run in a thousand horsepower okay. Yamaha? Usually, I I care more about the the uh, the um, I care more about using a thicker oil. So we obviously have more uh, ring sailing. Okay. Because really, that's that's the biggest problem on a high horsepower, like a turbo engine, because you always want to prevent uh, the rings to be wa either washed or they keep sealing and the oil is very relevant. So usually in a very high boost application, you have to use a thicker oil. Yeah. Yeah. Either oh, yeah. either like a straight 40, 50 or, or okay. even a, at least a 2050 on that right. side. I was going to say a VR1, like a 20W50. Yeah. I personally yeah. like that a lot. Yeah. Do you really? Okay, yeah. great. Uh -huh. That's all it I have, have a lot in my of garage. Zinc. It has a lot of zinc and uh, yeah. helpful. Yeah. Well, very good. Very good. Okay. We're, we are at an hour and 40 minutes. I cannot believe I got so much time out of you to do this. So thank no, you very right. much. I think I will let you guys go. I, I, I didn't see any more Super Chat questions that came in. <laughs> um, but we have so much to discuss. I think as more innovations come out and there's more stuff to talk about. Everyone's telling me I got to have Ernesto and you and you back. <laughs> yeah. So maybe yeah. we'll do four of us on here. The the one last thing, I, I mean, uh, one last but one thing we did on the on the Yamaha, which is cool. Uh, we can control the trim by from the fuel tech. So every time I press the launch, it mm -hmm. puts the trim to negative two. And I have a timer that I will actually command the trim to go whatever I want during the run. So I figured well, that would be cool because we can actually, that. okay. Yeah. So we actually on the drag race, so you can literally command a trim and like do auto trim for drag racing. Uh, you know, I've got to ask, you know, you, you tease the, the launch control in your last video with the jet skis uh, and you know, all this new stuff coming. When's that update 
for FT Manager being released because I want it on this. No, you already can. Uh, it's the launch control and that kind of stuff is already available. Okay. Let, let so me the, that drops the reverse bucket. Oh no, that that not yet. But uh, I can send you the better version. That's going to be released in December. But okay. uh, this kind of uh, usually we test in a better version first. And uh, but this this kind of stuff, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be gladly. We we are glad to to share not only to yeah. you, but if you if there is more people watching here and they want to test some of the stuff, get. Yeah, it. I, I'd be happy to test it. Yeah. yeah. Because for example, this, let me see. So this, <laughs> this example here, you see my, my throttle body here, my TPS was going full throttle here. Mm -hmm. So I opened the blow off to vent. So my, what I was trying to do was actually trying to build turbo speed here. So my turbo speed went to 17,000 RPM. Uh, and then as soon as I, uh, and I can see my trim here. So trim. Trim was negative two, you see. So trim was negative two, and then I put I commanded trim to go negative one and two and two and a half seconds or two point two seconds, then zero and plus one here, uh, the auto trim. So I can see the trim going up here, and uh, the traction control here. In this case, my traction control was a little loose. You see, this these mm -hmm. were actually my traction control heat. You see uh-huh so then if i go on the tune-up on this let me open this this is the tune-up from the from that pass uh i was this was the predefined rpm uh curve every time it launched so i have my predefined let's say in in 0 0.87 seconds i i will allow the engine to go 9300 rpm then 1.5 seconds 97 and then 1.87 10,500 so every time it tries to go above this it will hit a, a soft limiter mm -hmm. to prevent it to like to 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 spin or to to cavitate the pump the jet pump but then you can do if you have a like a if it's a supercharger one you can do a, a throttle body position ramp something that yeah. you wanna you, you it's like almost like a perfect driver like you can you can tell the guy oh you, you launch and have throttle and then you you gently come on Mm -hmm. You can do that electronically here. Uh, that was you what can... you and I were encountering, Greg. Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, you know, uh, as you know, cavitation is a huge issue on these higher horsepower skis. And, uh, you know, Kevin rode this one and within less than ideal pump setup, it was cavitating, you know, even at 3000 RPM when trying to launch it. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, a traction control obviously would help that tremendously but you know doing the launch control that with the reverse bucket that holds it in place yeah you know i think and it may just be a theory that not, may not work but it's already preloading the pump a little bit yeah putting water flowing so you uh are reducing the chance and amount of cavitation that were to happen versus stabbing the throttle from just idle mm -hmm. yeah and then you can select here so you pretty much we enable here if you want to the neutral bucket position during two step so you check okay. this and we'll we'll set that and then on the Anderson. two step you can select here whatever rpm you can let's say you want to you want to leave with 3000 rpm on the limiter or if you want to leave with 2000 whatever rpm it's necessary to to keep it uh, from moving mm -hmm. oh now here's a question now would, would what would be per, what would be preferable an, uh, an electric controlled blow off valve and controlling boost that way from in, in keeping from cavitation or using the reverse bucket no they're they're different the the blow off valve is only relevant for a turbo ski oh okay you you open the blow off from the in, the charge pipe and the turbo will free spin it, okay. you know what i mean then the then you, any rpm because on a race car Let's say if it, if it was this this engine was in a Honda front wheel drive okay. Honda, you need to launch at seven thousand RPM to spool that small engine, one point eight liter engine to spool that big turbo, right? Uh, obviously, if you try, you don't have the jet ski, so you ha you you cannot literally spool at seven thousand. So you you have to you have to open the blow off, so it's the, the the all the air from the turbo is actually going bleed off, 
so the turbo will free free rev okay. then uh, then you're not looking how much boost you build on the two step you're just looking how much turbo speed you're making and then All once right. you release you actually shut that off the turbo is spinning and then it boot, builds boost really fast uh, all right okay the reverse bucket is pretty much you can raise the rpm uh and the, the, and not rolling into the beams or how do you call you're actually really holding the ski stop 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 the only downside on that greg mm -hmm. is obviously there is like a couple tenths or three tenths of a second to actually move up uh -huh. um, then you need to take in consideration so pretty much the driver has to have two three tenths in advance to release okay so you then you need to almost wait until the movement to go up to mm -hmm. uh, to release the throttle and really go full throttle so that is the tricky point also i tried that on my yamaha with and i figure if a 7000 rpm rev limiter it will actually break the bucket uh, <laughs> the plastic bucket so you need really to either build a billet one <laughs> if you're uh -huh. going really high or 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 build, build, uh, bring well, rpm down yeah the sea bucket it's yeah. metal reinforced and attached to the ride plate yeah so maybe something like that is worth worth a shot yeah. You know, yeah raise exactly. the rpm a bit yeah yeah that now i'm not surprised that the plastic bucket just blew out at seven thousand rpm yeah 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 surprise <laughs> okay i'm gonna end this one okay okay <laughs> we're gonna keep going for another another hour if we keep going but hey listen uh, i i really got to thank everyone for being here today i mean uh you were very very open with all of your information that you were not cagey or dancing mm -hmm. around or political you were like hey man I'll, I'll, let me bring up my computer let me show you yeah. everything i got and Absolutely. i think that speaks volumes to what fuel tech offers your customers uh hopefully tonight was able to, uh, tonight was able to really educate and really kind of open up the curtain on what's available through fuel tech um I, I think we might have sold a couple units already, but <laughs> yeah. just, in the, just in the comment section. Um, but again, Anderson, thank you very much for your time. I, I really appreciate your your honesty and just taking all of our questions and 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 talking about all this great stuff. No man, uh, again, I I'm I actually thank you guys. And again, I'm genuinely excited about these challenges and everything it's uh for us is uh it's uh something we always try to do something better fix a problem listen to the clients you know what i mean it's it's, it's not about the money it's about the challenges about to do something mm -hmm. different uh and uh, so definitely anyone interested uh, call us and uh, let us know anything you guys need uh, we're definitely here to to help <laughs> absolutely absolutely guys thank you again greg thank you for coming in tonight Yep. It was a Thanks, lot of man. fun. I, you, you, you become my, you become my, my partner in this podcast. Yeah, over yeah, the last your <laughs> hey, I'll take it, man. <laughs> Let's co-op this thing. I'm, I'm great yeah. with it. I, um, I'll send you the, the better version for the reverse. Line. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll have something to talk about. That'll be cool. Yeah. Well, everyone, if you haven't already, definitely go to fuel tech dot net is that correct fueltech.net yep. mm -hmm. and and check out what they've got obviously things are going to be updating on uh as new products come out we, we you know whether it's cdu or yamaha there's stuff coming so again uh go to fueltech.net check out everything from fueltech if you haven't already seen the video you can go to fueltech on youtube and watch the the results of of them developing the kit for the 325. And for Greg, obviously, definitely go visit greenholt.net, which is the world which is the world's biggest PwC community and forum. And uh, to let, me, let me tell you something. When I started in this world, I one of the first places I started searching was obviously your guys uh yeah. either videos and website and uh, mm -hmm. and one day I purchased something uh, <laughs> with uh, a green hook. Uh, uh -huh. and, and uh, was very very gladly you i think you guys call me because i wrote i, I bought something wrong or whatever mm -hmm. or, or check if it was right and immediately send me that that's very yeah. very good great experience <laughs> yeah you awesome. know we we're a smaller company and uh 
we do our best to have the best customer service out there. You know, yeah. it's a, we got a few guys in an office and if someone sends us an email where we try to respond as, as instantly as we can. And that's seven days a week, 24 hours a day, yeah. happy to answer any questions. And, uh, and of course our form, you know, it's like, a it's over 20 years worth of jet ski performance information. If you've got a question about jet skis, if we can't answer it, it's on our form. It's uh, yeah. it's really a fantastic platform that it's turned into. Yeah. Absolutely, I, I learned a lot of, uh, over there. <laughs> yeah, very cool, very cool. And for everyone here, if you haven't already, please hit the subscribe button. We we put out video every single day, Monday through Friday, as well as new articles at watercraftjournal.com. It is almost two hours. This is our record for our longest podcast, and I got to say, probably one of our most informative. So it wasn't just me sitting around reminiscing about old jet ski racing. So this is actually really, really cool. Guys, thank you again. We're going to log out. You have a good week, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, guys.